Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. From our team today, we're joined by Marinelle Armstrong with Tall Timbers Research Station. Today, we have a presentation by Dr. Nate Anderson from the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. Dr. Anderson will be giving a presentation today discussing his work on fuel treatment systems and related economics. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Nate Anderson is a research forester with the Research and Development Branch of the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Missoula, Montana. His specialization is forest operations, supply chain management, and economics, with recent work focused on using biomass for fuel treatment and forest restoration for bioenergy, biofuels, and bioproducts. Nate's PhD is in Forest Resources Management from the State University of New York, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He's been with the Forest Service since 2009. Well, Nate, it's great to have you here with us today. I'm excited to see your presentation. And one moment, everybody, as we just trade out these slides. That's great. Th thanks very much, David. And thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, and I will go ahead and share my slides here. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to be here. As David said, I'm in uh, Missoula, Montana, and but I have uh, spent some time in the Southeast. Um, there you go. How's that, David? Do you see in the full screen slides? Yes, I can. Okay. So one of the things I work on out here in the West um, is trying to connect fuel treatment and forest restoration with um, biofuels, bioenergy, bioproducts. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And though a lot of my examples and a lot of the things I'm talking about are going to be focused on the Northern Rockies and the Rocky Mountains in general, um, uh, hopefully you'll find some nuggets here in this in this webinar that you can apply where you are, or just kind of a, a broader understanding of the connection between industrial supply chains for these different downstream products, fuels, and, and products from biomass, and how we might be able to leverage that to get fuel treatment done on the landscape. So I'll give you just a little bit of background, especially for those of you who aren't that familiar with uh, supply chain management and supply chain engineering. Then I want to just touch on the current conditions in the Western United States. I'm not going to belabor this because I know most people on this call are probably very familiar with our ecological and management conditions in the West when it comes to wildfire. But I do want to spend more time talking about some of the operational and economic challenges that we face when it comes to using biomass from these treatments uh, in industrial supply chains for these products. And not to be a downer, I wanna leave the challenges associated with that and talk about solutions. What are we working on in industry, in government, in research, in at universities to, to try to solve uh, some of these supply chain challenges? And then I have a few conclusions for you. Um, Definitely want to leave time for questions and discussion at the end as well. So before I get into that, though, I, I want to thank the people who have been involved in a lot of the research that I'm going to talk about today. So certainly none of this is, po is possible without university partners. We, we do a lot of research with universities, faculty, staff, postdocs, graduate students um, in forest operations and supply chains. We really can't do any of this work without industry and NGO partners. Uh, partners in the land management agencies at state, at state, federal, and NGO level. And then I want to also thank uh, funding agencies that have funded a lot of this work over the last couple decades um, and highlight specifically the Mass Bio Project, which is ongoing. And then a couple recent U.S. Forest Service initiatives, one through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, which is just getting off the ground now, and a targeted allocation project focused on biochar. So here are my take home messages right up front so you can decide by the end of this presentation if I have uh, made, made the case for these uh, conclusions. But, you know, the big picture here is that harvesting biomass can help meet diverse land management objectives, including when our primary objective is reducing wildfire risk. But in a lot of places, the net financial costs of using the material is greater than pile burning to get rid of it. Um, but we are making 
improvements and uh, across the board in different areas that help us reduce costs and increase the value of these materials. And one of the things I want to make sure that you understand is that the favorable economics for biomass utilization often hinges on non-market values. That is, all of the things we are doing these treatments for that may not be reflected in the financial transactions between private companies along the supply chain. So you'll you'll get a little more information about that as we move along. So a little bit more background, just a couple of slides. When we think about supply chains, really we want to be thinking holistically, right? From from the forest to the to the end use and beyond to the final consumer. So we don't talk about the biomass supply chain as much as the bioproduct supply chain. This could be for fuels, chemicals, um, could be for heat and power, or some some other end use product, but this is across the whole chain. And often, when we talk about supply chain management and supply chain engineering and logistics, for example, we're trying to reduce unit costs and increase value. And we can reduce costs by increasing productivity, reducing the costs of of harvest and collection, processing, transportation, storage. Um, those sorts of things. And we're really trying to improve efficiency along that supply chain. We can also try to reduce transaction costs with long-term stable agreements for feedstock supply, for example. And we want to increase value. And a lot of times when we're thinking about increasing value across this whole bioproduct supply chain, we're thinking about quality of the products, consistency, stability, sustainability, reliability, and, and other values. And so we think a big picture, not just biomass production as, as foresters and land managers, we're often kind of obsessed with the left-hand side of this, um, but we wanna be thinking of across production, logistics, conversion, those are our customers, are we getting them what they need? And then distribution and end use, all of that's important and flows all the way back. Today, I'm gonna to focus mostly on these green boxes. So the biomass supply chain, that is the forest to the gate or the stump to gate uh, supply chain. And that um, that's gonna be the focus today, but we wanna have that big picture in mind in terms of what a supply chain is. And you know the definition of a supply chain is really all the organizations that are involved in, in moving these materials and moving uh, information and capital flows across this, uh, this chain. So, Let's talk about current conditions for a minute. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna belabor this because most people on this call are very familiar with our situation nationally and especially in the Western United States when it comes to wildfire risk. But we have many millions of acres with densely overstocked forests. Um, we have some species composition challenges in terms of uh, shade tolerant species in the understory creating ladder fuels forest health problems with drought stress, insects, disease, uh, stand damage, resulting in high mortality and low vigor in these stands, like this one in Montana that was the result of the mountain pine beetle epidemic. Um, on the management side of the equation, we also have some pretty severe challenges. And so these forests are prone to large, severe wildfires. We have a lot of development in that wildland urban interface. I know most of you are familiar with these issues, so I won't belabor it. Uh, climate change is making conditions worse. It's making it more challenging. Um, we, have, we have come to expect a lot of ecosystem services from our forests and those values are at risk. We have escalating cost of wildfire management, especially suppression, but also treatment, fuel treatment on the ground. And you know, overall, as an agency, we have fewer resources um, in the U.S. Forest Service for all the other management needs, in including fuel treatment. So this is a well-known story to those of us on this call. Um, you know, at the same time, we have some pretty lofty management goals. So we're we're against the we're against the wall in terms of our our ecological conditions and our management conditions. But we have some pretty pretty sweeping goals. So forest landscape restoration to produce fire resilient forests, drought resilience under climate change, more heterogeneity within this range of variation that we want to see on the landscape. So we can target stands to try to get into this restored condition. 
Um, but we also want to be restoring burned areas after fire so we don't get the state transition from, from forest to non-forest condition. And the big picture here is protecting ecosystem function, right? Soil conservation, soil recovery, um, ecosystem recovery, watershed function, hydrology, biodiversity, kind of the, the foundation of our ecosystem services. And we need to be delivering these ecosystem services as well, right? Timber, biomass, water, recreation, cultural values, all kinds of other stuff. And increasingly, we're looking at carbon storage and climate change mitigation and looking at the wildfire baseline that we have as an unacceptable condition for our forests when it comes to carbon storage and climate change mitigation. So we're trying to move these forests into a different space. Um, we're doing it at multiple scales across landscapes, within individual stands, even you know ac across stands, even within individual stands, looking at depending on the forest type, this heterogeneity of age class and spatial patterns and structure and composition, you know, single random group trees, you, you know the story on the silvicultural side. That's the kind of conditions that we have for you. And I, I want to start talking a little bit about more about those supply chains and how they're connected. So we've got some big challenges here with fuel treatment with regards to implementing these treatments on the ground. And so I just wanna make the comparison here to commercial timber operations. Compared to commercial timber operations, these fuel treatments are difficult to implement. They have complex residual stand conditions. They have a lot of oversight that can be complicated. Um, they typically have higher costs. There's a variety of reasons for that, but lower product values because we're removing understory trees, dead trees, dying trees, and leaving the biggest, healthiest, most value, most commercially valuable trees behind. Limited markets for products in many of these places, which can be remote. We have higher risk to personnel and property, not just with prescribed fire, but also with uh, sending logging crews into heavily damaged stands, for example. That's a challenging logging environment with a lot of dead wood flying around it. That's more risky. Um, and then complex valuation. I'll get to that later in the presentation, but th these are not easy to value compared to commercial timber sales. And then what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is large volumes of non-saw biomass. So that's tops, limbs, small trees, dead trees, unmerchantable logs, cull sections, unmerchantable species in these stands. Nobody wants it. It just gets piled up and there is a tremendous amount of it. So just burn it, right? That's that's might be going through your minds. Just burn it. And we do. We burn, we burn a lot of piles. We do a lot of broadcast burning and we burn a lot of this biomass. When we think about pile burning, at least in, in my neighborhood out here in the in the Rocky Mountain West, you know, this is a really common practice. We know how to do it. We have good cost estimators for it in the agency. We have, you know, pretty routine approaches to this. And honestly, it's pretty low cost to take a drip torch and fire these piles up, right? Compared to some other things that I'll talk about in a minute. But it's not without cost. And so I have financial here in bold because we want to separate financial costs. That is, what are we paying these two people to go out and do this um, from other costs that may not be in the financial transaction? So smoke and how that smoke impacts communities, especially in the wildland urban interface greenhouse gas emissions, soil damage under these piles where some pack, some places we're going back decades later and we're not getting any growth. Sometimes when we do get growth, it's with invasive species who favorably colonize these burn scars. We have escaped fire risk that's kind of at the top of everybody's mind right now. Narrowing burn windows, not just in terms of fire risk and conditions and climate change and when we can and can't burn, but also smoke and air quality and and how if, if we're producing 200 piles and we can only burn two every year that's a pretty bad balance and then this is a new one for me uh recently talking with people that the liability associated with escape fire risk make kind of boxes us into a corner where we have to have uh federal personnel doing a lot of these treatments on the ground rather than contractors so a lot of people saying well Let's use it then. Can't, can't we use it for something? And and you see a lot of figures like this one on the right 
that says, hey, you look at all this stuff you could use. And biochar is not even on here. I'll talk about biochar in a little, little bit. But, um, you know, certainly solid wood product supply chains, manufactured panels, um, different types of uh, engineered wood products, everything that can come from pulp. And then all the kind of sexy stuff, right? The, the biofuels, biochemicals, carbon nanotubes, nanomaterials, lignin-based adhesives, 3D printing resins, right? And then the less sexy stuff, just make power out of it. Just make heat, heat and power, utility power, that kind of stuff. So yeah, we can use it. Um, some of the benefits of using um, this material is there's no smoke. If you can get it off the site, we want to make sure to leave enough biomass behind to meet our ecological objectives. But even so, there's a lot we can remove, no smoke, different greenhouse gas emissions or lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we can talk about that at a different session, but uh, greenhouse gas emissions profiles different than pile burning, better for soils, less invasive species on those burn scars, wider harvest windows. We can contract this out all day long without a high level of liability. Um, we get some revenues at the end of the day, and there are other values associated with this that I'll talk about. But as you all know, um, sometimes site access is really difficult. We have a lot of uh, deferred road maintenance on our national forests that, you know, low standard roads in the, to start out with are now really in need of, of a lot of maintenance to get this material out. And we can have high net costs. So it's kind of this hammer and anvil of high harvest costs, high trucking costs, high logistic costs against low market value. And that's if you can even find a market for these materials. So let's talk about that. Um, one other thing I wanna mention is um, the regional decline in what have traditionally been very large consumers of biomass. And so if we think of Smurfit Stone outside of Missoula in Frenchtown, Montana, in the top left, you know, this, was half a million tons of biomass every single year just to fire their boilers and provide process heat and power. And, you know, that's a lot of biomass, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of chip bands going in, into that place every year. Um, other facilities, and we have lost a lot of this capacity. So the traditional the traditional outlets, the traditional markets for large amounts of biomass in for, form of pulp wood, but also in slash and, and hog fuel and chips, we've lost a lot of that. And we've lost, you know, utility capacity and biomass utilities and co-firing, some, some pellet mills, a lot of the manufactured panels and, and large facilities. So, you know, this is kind of an ugly situation, but one of the things a lot of people are working very hard on is thinking about biomass as an opportunity to expand the bioeconomy and make products that have lower greenhouse gas emissions and, and better environmental ben benefits, lower environmental costs than traditional fossil fuel-based products. So we're thinking about power, combined heat and power, things like biochar, which is a charcoal we can use as a soil amendment, biofuels, chem chemicals, um, wood pellets, institutional heating, and a whole bunch of other products. I, I, I included these pictures here just because they're projects that I've personally worked on, but we could add all kinds of other um, products to this list. And, you know, to, to put a little positive spin on forest biomass, let's just think about forests and forest biomass for a minute compared to agricultural systems. Agricultural systems are perfect, perfectly capable of growing a lot of biomass quickly in short rotation crops, annual crops, switchgrass, things like that, um, woody species like willow or hybrid poplar. But, you know, natural forests and plantation forests have some big advantages. We get have incredibly large stocks of these materials as a waste or a byproduct a lot of different options for material cost and quality from really, really, really rough, pretty bad hog fuel to um, clean, dry microchips that can be used for high-end fuel production. Often these materials can get, we can get, acquire these at low zero or negative stumpage cost. That is a tipping fee. Um, 
often these materials are produced in locations that are co-located with existing infrastructure and, and existing industry. So we have loggers, we have truckers, we have facilities, we have concentration yards, we have hardened industrial sites. All of that's good. And generally, this is these materials are pretty good carbon balance and, and sustainability. Obviously, that depends on land use. If we're clearing forests to make condos, well, maybe maybe not a great carbon profile on that. But generally, forest that follows forest and we're, we're producing this biomass sustainably, that's a pretty good carbon profile. And then we have all these other benefits, um, reduced wildfire risk, lower smoke effects, diverse ecosystem services. So it's not a bad feedstock, actually, compared to some others, like corn ethanol, for example. Um, so let's talk about some supply chain solutions here. So I'm going to go through a set of um, R&D projects that we've worked on that try to address some of the big issues that um, that hinder the flow of biomass from fuel treatment and forest restoration to some useful purpose downstream in industry. Um, I want to talk first about some planning tools and planning approaches that we've developed, then look more in, in terms of forest operations and logistics, especially transportation logistics. Then talk a little bit about increasing value. So those thir first three you know, are focused on reducing costs. And then we're going to talk about increasing value. So designer feedstocks coming out of the woods, right? This is, this is a place that we've done a lot of research, densifying these materials so we can increase transportation efficiency, but also have some uh, downstream benefits to, to users. And, and then non-market values. I'll hit this non-market values issue at the end of the presentation. So here's an issue. This looks like Northern Idaho, but it's actually the Colorado State Forest in Northern Colorado. And, and we worked with uh, Colorado State Forest on a, uh, a few different projects. Um, but one of the things we looked at was trying to use pretty sophisticated analytics to identify treatment units and make the decision of when you would and would not harvest biomass. And so the idea is that you would you would reduce costs by only harvesting biomass on units where it's favorable to do so economically. And so that that's important because if we just do this routine, we're going to harvest biomass everywhere, we end up with more costly biomass. But if we target the units um, for a variety of reasons that are you know whole tree harvesting leaves the biomass behind and we harvest that compared to lop and scatter where we just leave the material out for a, a broadcast burn or to decompose, um, we can get those costs down by, by, folk, by, by planning our operations very well. Similarly, uh, this was a, a project um, I worked on with Ryer Becker, Rob Keith and others at University of Idaho looking at some of the tethered and steep slope equipment that's coming online now and how we might be able to use LIDAR, LIDAR based map mapping combined with forest planning to understand where we should deploy equipment that actually results in biomass that can be harvested. So if we think about a tethered shovel system versus you know whole, whole tree yarding systems across the Nez Pierce, we can get different results and we, we can tailor our planning to places where it's appropriate and economically efficient to harvest biomass and leave find other solutions like pile burning in other places. Um, this is some work done by John Hoagland, led by John Hoagland uh, here at the Rocky Mountain Research Station to really put some teeth into procurement tools. So looking at high resolution biomass ma mapping in this particular example, close to uh, Helena, Montana, where we look at national forests and, and other forest ownerships. What's the available biomass? What's the available groundwood? What's the delivered cost? And we start to, in the bottom right-hand corner, we start to develop some supply curves for different prices and how much biomass could we deliver to a particular location for a particular price, and then we can tailor that scale of operations to what is realistically available uh, at a certain price for a particular operation. And this is kind of an important aspect of, of feedstock procurement and capital investment. 
So one other uh, planning tool I'll mention, we're working uh, with UA at Colorado State University and some others on the Mass Bio Project at developing inventory models that would help link a lot of different places on the landscape with a lot of different independent biomass suppliers under an inventory policy that would deliver this to either storage locations or a particular facility. In this case, we're modeling a biofuels facility at 100 tons per day. So about four, 100 dry tons per day. So about four chip vans a day. Um, and trying to drive down those costs with good procurement and good um, good ways of, of uh, obtaining and storing biomass in different locations. So let's get a little more dirt world here. Um, the planning stuff is you know that big picture. Let's talk specifically about operations. One of the things we do in the Rocky Mountain Research Station is partner with companies and with universities to conduct forest operations research where we actually develop cost models for different types of treatments on the ground. And so here's a really good example. Um, Graduate student Lucas Townsend and Beth Dodson, who some of you may know at University of Montana, we're looking at five different operations and we can break apart their costs. And this is very data intensive to break, a, break apart their costs and look at you know, all the different um, components of the delivered cost of biomass and roundwood separately and together and look at how some operations in similar conditions might be doing things very well and driving down those costs and others may have costs that are quite high on biomass removals that we can help we can help them improve their operations um, in a variety of ways. And so this is this is a really important contribution of operations research to this biomass uh, problem. Um, Pretty fun to talk about advanced equipment coming online. Some of it advanced, some of it not so advanced. Um, but how do we how do we develop new equipment, new systems, especially for difficult terrain, steep terrain, that can get us places where we typically can't go with um, with traditional ground based systems or on low standard road networks? How can we get biomass um, out to concentration yards or out to facilities? in ways that don't require us to use a 55 or 54 foot uh, chip van, which has very limited access on these low standard forest roads. So looking at equipment development, um, tethered and witch assist equipment is coming on very strong in certain places and we're um, looking at that now. So transportation logistics, similarly, we wanna drive down the cost by increasing transportation efficiency. There are different ways of doing that. Um, but certainly uh, improving access uh, of, of large chip vans to locations where we can get at the slash. Um, people have experimented with densifying this, the, um, in, in situations where you're getting up to volume before you get up to weight on these trucks, densifying that material, those, those sorts of things to get larger payloads and better efficiency. Um, let's talk about value now. You know, if we if we have biomass on landing and we're pushing it all over the place with uh, a bulldozer or with a blade on a piece of equipment, we get a lot of uh, dirt. We get rocks. Maybe we, <laughs> we get tires. Throw it in. Uh, throw it in the slash pile. Uh, we don't want to do that because that reduces the value of those materials. So we think about sorting slash on on the landing to make sure to to get value out of different materials. Value handling is what that's called precision grinding rather than, hey, all we've got is, you know, three inch minus, take it or leave it, hog fuel. That's all we got. We can actually work on precision grinding, production screening at high volume to try to get some better uh, value out of these things. Um, some of you may have seen different products like this coming out of roundwood or coming out even of, of slash coming out of the woods. So we see different types of products coming from the same parent material that meet different needs. It may be that a gasifier that's being used to produce liquid fuel from thermochemical conversion has a really narrow feedstock spec. And we need to hit it right on. It needs to look something like these materials and not like hog fuel, what you're used to seeing where it's kind of all over the map um, in terms of moisture content, quality, ash content, those attributes. 
um, densifying materials for energy uses. So we can think about briquetting and pelletizing um, in kind of a forward or forward operating environment rather than a, a large pellet facility. Um, slash bundling, this was something that has been tested in the South. So you may be uh, familiar with this. Um, this has some advantages in terms of material handling and storage. It's not a solution for everything, but you know, for certain types of operations, thinking downstream in terms of your conversion process and um, the value to your end user, this might be a good solution. Um, one thing, these, these uh, photos right here are, are from this week on the top and a couple of weeks ago on the bottom. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with mobile slash processing uh, with and without biochar production. So the, the unit on the top there is the Tiger Cat Carbonator. The unit on the bottom is the Air Burner Char Boss. Um, we're trying to put these machines through their paces. We have the carbonator deployed this week at a, at a sawmill in Montana. We've been, done you know half a dozen of demonstrations and field trials with the char boss and are continuing to do that. And the idea here is we can process slash, we can expand the burn window, we can process slash in a way that has a better uh, emissions outcome and also produces this biochar product we can use on site as a soil amendment, or we can ship off site as a product. So thinking about torrefaction and pyrolysis in that forward operating environment as a potential uh, process. And we, we worked on this since 2009 here in the Rocky Mountain Research Station with a lot of different companies. Um, so let's keep talking about solutions. Um, and I have a couple more solution slides and then, and then some um, uh, conclusions, and then we'll have some discussion. Um, why are we doing this? Why are we doing these fuel treatments? It actually has nothing to do with making a lot of money on you know, commercial supply chains, right? It's primarily to reduce fire risk. That's the proximate reason. But the ultimate reason is to protect all these ecosystem surfaces. So we want to reduce the fire risk, reduce um, you know, the, the risk of these severe wildfires, reduce risk to the wildland urban interface and, and human values at risk. But then all these other things, right? We're it, it, forest restoration, protecting watersheds, protecting biodiversity, recreation assets, um, cultural assets, all of those things. So I'm pointing this out because it, it's a pretty heavy lift to say, hey, the reason we're doing these treatments is to get all these values. And oh, by the way, this industrial supply chain should pay all the bills on this. We actually have we know and have documented that the public has a pretty high level of willingness to pay for less smoke, less poor air quality days, lower likelihood of their house burning down in a wildfire, better forest health, and they actually have willingness to pay for renewable energy. Their willingness to pay for those things is different in different places. It's not the same in California as it is in Montana or Wyoming, but, but it's we can quantify this, right? So we have all these non-market values and we need to incorporate this in our decision-making and our thinking and our valuation. Um, one of the ways we've done this is to, to, to conduct surveys to help us um, value these resources and how the public thinks about fewer poor air quality days, better, um, you know, better, lower wildfire risk and those sorts of things. And we can think of, you know, just, just pile burning um, this particular scenario for a power plant in Colorado, you know, it, 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 this particular scenario over 20 years, we lose $275 million. Now, notice I said lose. We're actually spending that to get all these things, right? So people think of that as a business, they're thinking of it as a loss, but it's actually that's what we're spending to get all the benefits that we get from fuel treatment, including pile burning. If we can get that material to a power plant, we actually spend less for the same outcome in the forest, 178 million. And if we include the non-market values, just four non-market values in this study, we get a better outcome. So we, we're spending even less if we account for the values. And then, boy, if we can incorporate non-market values and also bioenergy supply chains, 
you know, we end up spending $25 million instead of $275 million in terms of value, the value proposition. And this doesn't even include timber value. So with timber value, we actually end up, um, we end up pretty well off. And I'm pointing this out. This is a different study. We don't have time to go into the details, um, but I'm happy to answer questions. But check it out. Check out this paper um, that kind of lays this all out. And um, coming down the home stretch here, one of the, the there's a few themes that come out from all of these dozens of projects we've worked on, different types of economics and financial analysis and techno-economic analysis and emissions uh, work. There's a few things that are kind of drivers and barriers to success with with bioenergy. You know, one is integrating these things, standalone operations that aren't integrated with existing forestry, agricultural, and energy systems have a really hard time compared to projects that are integrated with existing forestry and forest industry infrastructure, agricultural systems, and energy systems. And so we can integrate you know, horizontally within the forest industry, like a facility getting into biochar production. Normally they're a, saw, a sawmill, but maybe they'll start producing biochar with wood waste or vertical integration. So maybe, um, you know, mills will start running logging equipment or having different types of equipment or, or um, things like that. So scale, matching the scale of an operation to the feedstock supply and the market demand. We hear a lot about economies of scale, bigger is better, it drives down unit costs, but we also wanna match our feedstock supply. Maybe we don't have a million tons a year in Missoula anymore. Maybe we only have, you know, 250,000 tons a year that we can play with, something like that. So we need to be careful and mindful of scale. Competition, both, you know, within in, within in a particular industry in terms of products and prices, um, and that pressure to innovate and do something new and increase productivity and improve product quality. Public policy, I'll talk about in detail on the next slide, so I won't... Um, talk too much about it here just to say that we need to have supportive pub public policy, especially when it comes to non-market values associated with biomass utilization. And in that realm, local policy and local support is critical, right? If we're going to do a big biofuels plant, um, we better have local stakeholders on online and, and supportive of that kind of project. So just a quick note about public policy. Um, we often feel very frustrated in the top green box forest policy and strategy compared to a lot of other countries. We do not have a strong national forest policy, and I mean that with a small n, not the U.S. national forest, but just a, a national scale policy related to forest utilization and how we use forests and what we expect from our forests. Um, but it cuts across all these other sectors. Let's so think about water policy and protecting watersheds, agricultural policy in terms of, um, you know, biochar soil amendment, for example, biodiversity, climate policy, energy policy is huge when it comes to biomass, jobs and economic growth and rural economic development policy. And so when we think about that, we can think about um, direct incentives to get some of these benefits, um, subsidies, right? That's People, people mostly think of subsidies when they think of direct incentives, but there are other mechanisms, grants, loan guarantees, public-private collaboration, partnerships, um, just having some guarantees in terms of offtake or biomass supply, feed-in tariffs, those sorts of things make a big difference. And then there's some other um, you know, mechanisms that are more flashy in terms of insurance and payments and things like that. And then research and development and extension falls into this. A lot of companies don't have a huge R&D branch, but if we can, universities and government agencies can help provide that, that's a big, big win. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this, make sure to uh, leave time for questions. We want to be thinking about the restoration economy not just one square in this flow of biomass, but thinking about all of it together. This this restoration economy and bio hubs and you know industrial hubs where we have a lot of go a lot going on. I mentioned an isolated operation by itself is it's much more difficult to finance 
and to be profitable than one that's integrated into a larger, bigger picture that uses, you know, every part of the tree and we get the, the benefits on the ground that we want from fuel treatment. Um, back to my take home messages. So we have harvesting biomass can help meet diverse management objectives. Those are typically much broader than just reducing fire risk on a particular piece of ground. However, we, we all know that net financial costs can be really high for implementing these treatments with biomass removals. Um, hopefully, I kind of opened your mind a little bit in terms of how we think about costs and benefits, not just in terms of the financial costs and benefits, but broader economic non-market valuation that is really the purpose of doing these treatments. And we're continuing to make improvements in forest operations, logistics, you know, business, supply chain management to reduce costs and increase value. And really the favorable economics, they often, it often hinges on consideration of non-market values and public policies that recognize these values and account for them. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm uh, um, glad I had the chance to present and look forward to the discussion. All right, Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for your presentation. If you all join us, uh, during the presentation, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange. And we had Dr. Nate Anderson, who is a research forester with the Rocky Mountain Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service in Missoula, Montana. Uh, we're at the point in our program where we can uh, engage in some conversation and get through some questions that you may have for Dr. Anderson. So if you'll please uh, use the Q&A tool in Zoom, uh, you can type your questions in there. Uh, if you see questions from other folks, uh, you can click on the little thumbs up and that'll help us to prioritize some of those questions and, and get to those as best we can in the time we have remaining. So we're going to leave his slides up. That way, if he needs to jump back and, and refer to anything um, in his slideshow as part of the, his answer, we can do that now. So good stuff. We already have some interesting questions that have come into the Q&A. So I'm going to get over and look at some of those and we'll get to those. Um, one of the questions that came in early on is from Jimmy, and Jimmy says that a lot of estimates of pile burning uh, include the cost of building the piles or the cost of implementing the burn. Uh, Jimmy says, however, he hasn't seen any estimates of the all-in costs that include building, burning, and, and then the sort of the back-end administrative work that goes into making a project like that happen. Do you have any uh, idea? Has anybody looked at those all-in costs um, or, or any comment on that? Yeah, sure. I don't. I don't have. Um, I don't have those uh, references at my fingertips. But you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is we we often in my world in forest operations research and supply chain management we focus on um, those costs that we can measure directly, right? So what are the labor costs? What are the diesel fuel costs? What's the transportation costs? And then the associated benefits, right? But this is a really, really good question. It's a huge, it's a very important point is often we leave out the transaction costs, right? The transaction costs are kind of a, the economic broad term associated with, you know, how much office time did it take to set this treatment up? How many people were involved? You know, if we're thinking in the in the federal realm, if we have a um, interdisciplinary team, an ID team associated with a treatment, you know, the, was this twenty people's time for fifteen months to get two hundred acres treated? You know, what, what's the transaction cost on that? In industry, especially with industrial timberland owner, owners. Um, timber investment management organizations, industrial facilities that own land, they can be very efficient with those transaction costs. But when we have more people along the supply chain, we get more transaction costs at each stage. And when you introduce the federal government as the primary feedstock supplier, those costs can escalate dramatically. And I'm not saying that as a criticism, I'm saying the federal government as a land management agency is among the most sustainable land management agencies in the world, partly because we have so many requirements, so many policies, so many laws that we have to consider. In a weird way, that makes our feedstocks really, really good for bioenergy, biofuels, bioproducts, because we know not only did a silviculturist look at this, but so did an archaeologist. So did so did a, a wildlife biologist. So did, so did someone 
reach out to the community. And, and so in some ways, it, it, you know, that those high transaction costs translate to pretty good feedstock supply in terms of sustainability. But um, the, the core question is, what are those costs? And I, I don't have any place to send you for that. A lot of people would rather not know. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess to follow up on that, I'm, do you have a sense, are the transition transaction costs um, higher or lower for many of these treatments that you described are are not broadcast burning, right? They're right. some other kind of fuel reduction treatment. Um, are those transaction costs higher or lower compared to prescribed burning, or does it depend? Yeah, so I think it depends. It depends on the landowner and the situation, but I'll, I'll I'll give you some rules of thumb on transaction costs, right? Anytime we have in the in the for the federal government, the U.S. Forest Service. Anytime we have materials leaving the site, it starts to look in our minds like a timber sale, right? Even if we know that stuff is functionally garbage, right? So it, it kind of kicks it into a different category of uh, administration, of contracting, of appraisal if we do that. A lot of people with this expertise, that is administration and contracting and appraisal, are looking at tools that would allow us to, to, to basically implement some, to have removals associated with service contracts, right? Like on Thursday after, you know, Thursday morning, I don't roll my garbage out to the curb and start taking bids on who's going to pay me the most for my garbage. It doesn't matter that they're taking it off my property. It, it's still garbage. And so we're trying to think, be creative there. So that will reduce transaction costs if we can get a lot of the contracting instruments we have were developed for green timber sales for good reason. We need to dispose of federal property in a way that, you know, gets the, the federal government the, the value of those materials on the open market. But these are more complicated and we're trying to work on those instruments that will allow more efficient engagement with users of these materials that would drive down costs, transaction costs included. The other thing, rule of thumb, I'll, I'll just say is, you know, the, the longer the period of the supply agreement, so let's just call it that for lack of better term, supply agreement for biomass, the lower the per unit transaction costs, right? So people are often obsessed with the term of a contract. So that is, we do 20 year stewardship agreements. The, the really important thing is actually the terms of the contract over that 20 years. That is, how much are we going to deliver annually or monthly to a specific facility in a reliable, consistent way? That's important. And if we have good terms over a large term, that means you drive down those transaction costs rather than piecemeal contracts, 200 acres at a time. That's a very, very expensive way to do business. This is fascinating. I'm a fire ecologist, so I don't think about this stuff pretty much ever. And so trying to wrap my head around it is, is fascinating. Um, we've got some more good questions in here. I want to make sure we get to them. Uh, and this is sort of a big picture. And, and this is uh, from Joe Royce. We know Joe. So good question, Joe, and really getting to the, the nugget for many of us coming from the southeastern U.S., where prescribed fire is such a, a pivotal tool uh, for managing ecosystems on public and private lands. And Joe says, all right, so being a southerner, he says, what are the problems with prescribed fire? Well, you all know the the, the problems with prescribed fire in the south better than I do, so I won't speak to the <laughs> south, but I, I will speak to the problems with prescribed fire, it, 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 particularly pile burning um, in my neck of the woods, right? Is like, we, we have a lot of treatment in the wildland, the wildland urban interface. And we we end up with a lot of piles spread all around with good intention that either no one wants us to burn because they don't want the smoke in the shoulder seasons. I know culturally in the South, there's a much higher um, a, a kind of appreciation for the purpose of that smoke that's, you know, comes during prescribed burning season. Um, a, a lot of communities in the Rocky Mountains that are hammered with smoke all summer long don't want it in the shoulder seasons. So we have this, this public 
you know, this, this, we have a, a pretty heavy lift just in terms of public perception and public acceptance. But there's another issue too, in a lot of places we're accumulating piles because of air quality restrictions and increasingly narrow burning windows. So I would say there are, there's no problem with prescribed burning. In fact, we need to do more of it. And this is an, an alternative to pile burning for all situations. It's a complementary aspect to pile burning because as those burn windows close because of escaped fire risk, climate conditions, snowpack, you, you know, you, you name it, how many days a year can you can you can you actually burn piles or do prescribed burns or social license to do that burning? And then also air quality. So in low air quality attainment areas, we might produce 200 piles in a valley. We can burn two a year. That's a net of 198 piles. So the next year, guess what happens? We produce another 200 and burn two, another 200 and burn two, another 200 and burn two. What, what's the end game, right? So we do need alternatives. And so what I would say is biomass utilization is not appropriate for places where we want strong ecological response in places where risks are low and we can do broadcast burning. It's not appropriate for places where we have piles that have accumulated in areas we can't get to, we can't, we can't access, we can't remove that material without millions of dollars of road building costs or road maintenance costs. I shouldn't use that word road building. Um, but certainly in places that are kind of meet these other criteria, we can go for it. And we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons, millions of tons of biomass that, you know, is is kind of the low hanging fruit that we should go after. Let's get to some two questions here um, that kind of get into a little bit more focused on these some of these techniques. Uh, Jimmy is asking about uh, mobile biochar equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you talk about, he says, the, the, the operational constraints? Um, is there net uh, concerns about ember escapes from these uh, bits of these tools? Um, are there needs for dust management? Um, so thinking about, you know, having this equipment uh, in the woods and, and operating, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that sounds good. I'll put, a, I'll put a picture on the screen here um, just so we can look at like the lowest tech. So top right hand corner here, the, this is a uh, Oregon kiln um, style way of making biomass uh, biochar from biomass it's the throughput on this is obviously quite small um but it's more of a hobby scale uh practitioner scale demonstration scale unit um here in the top right this is from from a demonstration in utah and um so there, there's no kind of ember control there's no um that's very very low capital investment pretty low throughput if we go to later in my presentation, I showed a couple for, for biochar production, right, is um, right here. So the, the, the carbonator and the char boss are meant to be forward operating um, pieces of equipment. Um, again, by, you know, by forced industry standards, if I park a giant Peterson grinder on this site and you know, produce 50 dry tons an hour of hog fuel off these piles. I can chew up a lot of piles. These don't, these aren't nearly that kind of throughput, not even close, but we can use some slash and produce biochar consistently on a site with pretty low labor requirements. And we can use that char on that site for a few different things, road rehab, um, site rehab for log landings. We have a lot in the Forest Service, we have a lot of mine sites where the soils are very, very poor, very low organic matter content. If we get those in, in soils, it increases the water holding capacity, increases the plant growth on those sites, helps restore those soils that are degraded. So there's some benefits there in terms of land management that just don't hinge just on slash disposal. Upscaling from this scale, we start to go to more centralized facilities. So facilities that can use 100 tons a day, um, 200 tons a day in biochar production. Those tend to be more centralized or, or modular type facilities. So um, David, if you could just repeat the tail end of your question, the components um, of, of the question, I, I don't think I hit them all. 
they were asking about are there on, 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 on like oh, you're just showing the screen there now oh steep almost, ember risk yeah yeah so are there concerns so, about having those in the field about ember risk or do you have to have dust abatement on the site um things yeah, like that's that. a good it's a good question those of you who have stand stand stood next to a large grinder uh those can throw up a lot of dust especially if the materials dry depending on the species composition you know cedar is, is dry cedar is horrible um so these two particular units i'll speak to not all biochar production kilns have any sort of air curtain over them both of these do so they have an air curtain that is a large blower that blows an air curtain across the top that reduces amber reduces smoke reduces emissions um, there is always a risk of fire, right? Um, what I'll point out on in this in this picture, and this is something we're testing, is you can see the inside of this material, this thing on the bottom is white. It's not black. This is not a dumpster, right? This is this has refractory cement. In fact, this thing weighs seventeen thousand pounds because it has refractory cement on the inside. So it has an air curtain blown across the top of it to recirculate the smoke and to keep the, the embers in there if it's loaded properly. And then it, you can walk up to this when it's running and put your hand right on the side without being burned. You can notice there's rubber tires operating right next to the burn box, which is set on the ground and has a conveyor. So the tires aren't melting, the components aren't melting. So like any piece of heavy equipment in the woods, there's a fire risk, right? We, we do hoot owl, at certain times a year, we have to we have to uh, stay on the site to make sure we didn't start a fire from conventional forestry equipment. Those types of regulations would apply here. the The tiger cat uh, carbonator on the top has similar insulation, um, has a, a a large air burner across the top. Probably ember escape is the number one issue that I that I hear with these forward operating machines, these mobile machines uh, among uh, you know, fuels professionals and fuels managers in the national forest. They really don't trust them that they're not gonna pop an ember and just light, light something up. So what we like to think of is you know, that, that these are probably not perfect for all conditions, but certainly their burn window is much larger than pile burning. I right. would say that that, that the that the risks are probably on par with conventional, you know, hot saws and other types of forestry mm -hmm. equipment in dry environments. Do you know is anybody uh, experimenting or using these in the southeast? Um, so the company, one of the companies. So just to be clear, I'm not endorsing any particular companies, but we've worked with a dozen companies yeah. on mobile biochar equipment. So I will mention that. Um, Airburners Inc. is actually located in um, in Florida, mm -hmm. and so one of the things they've used these uh, and tested these um, air curtain burners and this yeah. char boss on is um, wood waste from hurricanes and storms. Um, and so that you know that's a big thing. They both of these companies make you know large equipment. This this what you're looking at the green machine is uh, the smallest machine they make. So. Um, Poke around with these companies and some other companies, but certainly there are probably applications for these in the in the U.S. South. And and yes, they have been tested, and yes, you know they're floating around. We did a demonstration in West Virginia of the char boss mm -hmm. on the bottom there. I'm, I'm familiar with the ACIs, the air curtain incinerators, and, and part <laughs> li living in Florida, there's lots of land clearing and development, and so there's always mm -hmm. material that's going into these. And also, as you said, dealing with hurricane debris is nearly an annual um, issue on. Yeah, and I'll mention the difference between those air curtain incinerators that bring the feedstock to ash mm -hmm. um, is these units are specifically designed not to bring the material to ash, but to bring it to a higher carbon content uh -huh. output, which we call biochar. So, um, so the, you know, 80% carbon um, between, depending on the machine, between uh five and 15 or 20 percent mass dry mass throughput char output so um, you can see some of the you can see some of the the fixed carbon um, readings on the right hand side from different types of equipment well we i want to get to one more question this is one that came in early on your presentation uh from david berglund and 
Uh, David's asking two different things. This will be our last one we get to today. Uh, David's asking, would the would the trucking cost be equal to the timber transport transport costs if you were to chip materials on site? So that's that's part one of his question. And part two um, is it. He's asking if it's if there's still markets to export uh, some of these materials. He says to Sweden, but to let's say to Europe. Sure. Um, sure. Could you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, good questions. Um, so I, I would say uh, the cheapest thing we can do operationally is put logs on a log truck. Loaders are cheap. Skidders are cheap. Log trucks are cheap, and they're efficient, and it's dense. Logs are dense. Um, if we're not talking about logs, that is, you know, roundwood, um, we, we can be talking about low grade roundwood, right? So, you know, tree length firewood, post and pole kind of stuff, low grade logs, get it on a log truck and get it out of there, get it to someplace that can use it if you're going to use it downstream in the supply chain. We're not talking about logs. You know, one of the challenges is the stuff that's left behind is really bulky. And so if we try to bring it out in the form of slash, that is, we, we just take a grapple loader and we stick it in the back of a truck and get it on a truck, that truck is going to be carrying not that much weight. And, you know, in terms of transportation efficiency, we want trucks to be at their maximum legal weight every time we send them down the road. And if we just fill it with slash, it's not going to be, not even close. And so we grind the material to get it in the back of a large, the largest chip van we can find that can access that site in order to get that thing to wait to you know, maximize the transportation efficiency. But we know that's not always possible. So we experiment with different things. You know, Grinding is, is pretty expensive in terms of fuel throughput, but you try to make it up on the transportation efficiency. You know, if a grinder is $700, $700 an hour to run, but it's doing 50 tons an hour, you know that's a that's a different calculus. So we want we have experimented with lower cost options, bringing slash out of difficult sites, and it's it's costly, but it it, it provides some other benefits. Um, now export markets. Hopefully that touched on the question. So export markets, pellet exports in the United States from the United States, as you all know, in the South are driven primarily by public policy in other countries, public policy to decarbonize their energy systems, typically large scale utility systems like Drax power in, in the UK, right? Um, and so those, those um, export markets are often for for wood pellets that are going in like a Panamax vessel or some extremely efficient supply chain um, transportation wise to get it over there. You could ship pellets from British Columbia to Europe through the Panama Canal if they're sawmill residues, right? You have sawmill residues sitting around, let's make them into pellets and send them over. The pelletization incidentally is to improve transportation efficiency. It's not necessarily required for handling on the other end. Um, so for these really low grade materials, that's like stuff with bark in it, with needles, with stuff like that. Um, a lot of the markets that we look for in Asia, for example, like, like Japan, China, um, South Korea, they want a clean chip maybe, or maybe they want a pellet or even some, you know, some round wood fuel product. They don't necessarily want the guts and feathers, the needles, the bark. The, the high diversity, high ash content stuff. So I think we'd, we'd have to talk about the specific market related to the question, but that's a kind of a big picture view of those markets for biomass products. At about handle it or I, you have something else? Yep, that did. Thank you so much. Okay. I got your... Uh... Your email address up here on the screen. Thank you for taking the time to answer all of our questions. Uh, this has been this has been fascinating. It's a, it, again sometimes when we do these webinars, it's like stepping into a whole other world uh, to to learn and to wrap your head about to wrap your head around. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, do you have any uh, final comments or remarks that you'd like to share with folks today? Um. Yeah, just just something quick. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us today. Really um, enjoyed the the opportunity to, to talk with you about this these issues. And I also say, 
you know, with with the technologies that are coming online, with the uh, capital that's flowing into forest carbon markets right now for voluntary carbon offset markets and regulated markets, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, with the Inflation Reduction Act, with all of this, uh, re all of these resources focused on forests, it we are at a really, really great time to make some progress with connecting these difficult treatments for fuel treatment, wildfire risk reduction, and forest restoration to the market economy and re renewable energy and renewable products. So I, it's it's a really exciting time to be working in this space. Well, great. Well, thank you for sharing. As we're in this exciting time, thank you for sharing uh, uh, this information with us and, and giving the presentation today. Mm -hmm.